We'll go now to our second speaker, uh, Peter Galbraith. Ivan, thank you for that um, presentation. I apologize for being a few minutes late. The vagaries of the shuttle in this weather, which uh, in the Northeast is less good than it is here. Uh, let me just uh, begin by picking up on the broader theme that you raise, which is the question of um, question that has uh, intrigued me, I suppose, having worked in so many divided states and, and observed the, the policies that we follow. Uh, almost invariably, the United States has an extraordinary commitment to the continued existence of every state that exists. This was most prevalent in 1991 when George H.W. Bush did everything he could to hold the Soviet Union together, uh, including going to Kiev on the 1st of August of that year uh, to warn the Ukrainians against uh, nationalism speech that became known as the Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, uh, I, uh, it was an extraordinary commitment of U.S. prestige and diplomacy at a time when it was just unrivaled in the world to a cause that was totally hopeless and in which we actually had no interest uh, because within the month Ukraine was independent. Um, uh, the same error was made with very tragic consequences in Yugoslavia, where James Baker went on the 21st of June, uh, 1991, to warn the leaders of the six republics of the then Yugoslavia that if they broke up the country, that those who broke away would, could expect no sympathy from the US. But at that point in time, the people of Slovenia and Croatia had already voted overwhelmingly for independence, the leaders, Tudjman in Croatia and Kuchan in Slovenia, were them, their whole being was about independence. Uh, they, the date was set for the 25th, four days later, and of course they went ahead. Uh, and it, it was not possible at that time, or indeed many months in advance, to have saved Yugoslavia. Uh, and there was no point in trying to save Yugoslavia. Uh, the world is not worse off, in fact, I think it's better off that there's no Soviet Union. It's not worse off that there's no Yugoslavia. But the tragedy of the Yugoslav situation is, was not the breakup of the country, but the violence. And the violence was definitely preventable in the spring and early summer of 1991. The holding Yugoslavia together uh, was, was not a possibility. And we continue uh, with this uh, commitment uh, to the unity of uh, every state that exists so that, for example, in Iraq, one of our major objectives, as stated by the second President Bush, was the unity of Iraq. Uh, and yet there is a part of the country uh, Kurdistan, in which every single person there, uh, at least everyone that I've met, and uh, this was also uh, expressed in a referendum that was held at the time of the first Iraqi elections, which, uh, I mean, every Kurd I've met favors independence. That includes uh, those who hold prominent positions in the central government in Baghdad. And in a referendum that the Kurds held uh, at this time of the uh, uh, January 30th, 2005 elections, uh, they voted 98% uh, uh, for independence. Uh, it was obviously a non-binding referendum. Uh, and so, uh, the, uh, the, again, I would say that the interest that we have in Iraq is not, not in the unity of the country, but in avoiding violence. Now, there are obviously circumstances where you, the continuation of the state, of a state, may also be related 
to avoiding violence, and to some degree that may be true in Iraq. Uh, certainly it had the Kurds, to, Kurdistan declared itself independent in 2003, uh, that would have produced a very violent reaction from Turkey. Uh, but as the situation has evolved in Turkey's thinking, uh, you had ex extraordinary statement by General Kanan Evron, who was the last military dictator of Turkey, who staged the coup in 1980. As military men do, they made, made himself president. Uh, he was the guy who launched the crackdown on the Kurds in southeast Turkey. Uh, this was a time when to describe the, the people of southeast Turkey as Kurds was, prevent, was uh, illegal. It was, they were mountain Turks. Uh, but recently he said, what are we, you know, what's this business about an independent Kurdistan in northern Iraq? Of course it exists. We have to get used to it. Uh, and incidentally, it's not a threat to Turkey. Now, again, I'm not saying that Turkey would, if, if Kurdistan declared itself independent tomorrow, that Turkey would uh, be very enthusiastic about it. But there's a, there's a clear evolution uh, in that situation. Uh, the, the other frame with which we discuss these problems is that we, we tend to describe the people of these areas by the, the state. Uh, the number of times that uh, I heard the phrase Yugoslavs from people. Uh, I can assure you I never met a Croat who ever accepted that he was a Yugoslav. Uh, there were a few people of mixed, uh, products of mixed marriages who described themselves as Yugoslavs. You're not going to contradict me on that one. <laughs> uh, there might have been some Serbs who would describe themselves that way, but not so many. I mean, a certain number of Bosnians, uh, Muslims, uh, but, uh, but, but fundamentally, uh, this, this isn't how they looked at it. This was really a construct that, that, uh, that we had. Uh, we also referred to Soviets and Czechoslovaks, and we referred to Iraqis. Uh, and again, uh, virtually every Kurd, if you ca call him an Iraqi, he's a f he or she is, is offended. Uh, and frankly, it describes even, it, this sort of break describes how we, we view the country. I listened to you describing Iraq as flat. Well, that's true for the part of Iraq that thinks of itself as Iraq. Uh, but if you look at the map, that isn't strictly speaking true. Um, it's flattened in Afghanistan, right? That's, well, parts of Afghanistan are flat, and incidentally, that, the, the flat parts, at least in the south, is where much of the problem is. Uh, but um, uh, if, you, if you then sort of stop at the filter of, of looking at existing states and also consider nationalities, uh, it, gives you, it gives you a rather different picture. Uh, and it shows, I think, why, in fact, we, aren't, we, we were never going to lose the Iraq war in the sense that there was never going to be a moment well, we, we, were, we were going to lose it if our objective was the unity of Iraq uh, or a, a, a stable, peaceful, democratic, uni unified Iraq. Yes, okay. But we weren't going to lose it in, this, and, in the picture that was painted by uh, former Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, who said, imagine what would happen if Al-Qaeda, you know, if we pulled out and Al-Qaeda would be, be, be taking uh, the uh, taking over in Baghdad. Uh, the, the image evoked was from Vietnam, you know, those North Vietnamese tanks uh, uh, knocking down the open gates of the presidential palace in Saigon. That wasn't going to happen in Iraq. Simple demographics. Sixty percent of the population are Shiite. Uh, and they were in control of the, the army. It's, of course, a Shiite army. Uh, the uh, controlled the, the south. Uh, they weren't, um, there, there was no way that the Al-Qaeda Ba'athist insurgency was going to be able to defeat them. Uh, and the Kurds, who were by, who had, and uh, certainly in, in the uh, earlier, you know, a few years ago, and maybe even still today, the strongest military in Iraq, they weren't going to be defeated by the uh, Al-Qaeda element. There was no, obviously no support uh, among the Shiites for Al-Qaeda for Al or the Salafis. Uh, who view the Shiites as apostates and people who should be killed. 
uh, the Kurds, uh, there was virtually no support uh, uh, in Kurdistan. Uh, so we really were talking about a problem that existed in about 20% of the, of the population. And of course, the, the problem solved itself when uh, the fundamentalist element, uh, who the, the local power structure, the Ba'athists, were very happy to have them come as long as they were killing Americans, the joining and killing Americans, that was great. As long as they were joining, as long as they were killing Shiites, hey, that was fine, even if there were big massacres of Shiite civilians. But then, if, then they began to shake down the sheikhs for money. They began to demand their daughters in forced marriages. Uh, and they began to kill the local tribal sheikhs. And at that point, these guys said, well, we've had enough. And they asked the Americans for money. They didn't need to ask for weapons. And in a very short period of time, they were able to defeat them. Um, and, and that, I think, is, the, well, that is the, the situation in Iraq. I don't know whether, after US withdrawal, it will dissolve into violence. Uh, actually, uh, I think there's a certain st innate stability to what has happened, uh, be precisely because Iraq does already have an extremely decentralized constitution in which it is a confederation, at least it's a confederation between Arabs and Kurds, uh, in which Kurdistan uh, has all the trappings of an independent state, including its own army, its own legislature, uh, its own flag. It, only recently, when the Iraqi flag was redesigned, it was, did they allow it to fly there? Its own, its own immigration. You, you, you need a visa to go to Iraq, but you don't need a visa to go to Kurdistan. Uh, uh, so. Uh, and that, that, the fact that it has all the trappings of an independent state, frankly, reduces the incentive to go for formal independence. Uh, as between the Sunnis and the Shiites, they do think of themselves as Iraqis, and I don't think you can think of a symmetric devolution of power in that country. The other, the other thing about Iraq, so it basically the Iraqi system allows those who really want to govern their own affairs and be independent to be independent. And those who don't, they don't have to. Uh, and at the center, it had, with the supermajority system uh, and the allocation of positions, each of these groups is represented in the central government. So while a Shiite is going to be the prime minister, he doesn't choose the other ministers. He's, if there are 20 ministers, 10 of them will be Shiites. Five will be Kurds, but it will be the Kurdistan nationalist parties that choose the Kurdish ministers, and the Sunni parties choose the Sunni ministers. And so the bargaining takes place within, within the cabinet. It's, it, quite often, issues are not resolved. But on the whole, I think it's not a bad system. And I think I, I'm more optimistic that there will not, that the real danger of violence in Iraq, which is, uh, Violence uh, among the, these organized statelets, if you will, the Kurdistan, Shiistan, Sunnistan, I, I, I think that, that there's a very good chance that that will, be, that will not happen. Um, let me turn uh, to Afghanistan, which has obviously been at the center of my thinking for uh, the last year. Uh, one of the problems of Afghanistan is that it has a government structure that is completely unsuited to the country. Uh, and and so there are a lot of similarities between Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq, you have the three groups. Uh, in Afghanistan, there, there are four. Uh, uh, the Pashtuns at about 45 percent, the uh, Tajiks at 25 percent, the um, Hazaras, who are Shiite, at 10, the Uzbeks at 5. Both countries have some Turkmens. Um, uh, but it's, it's uh, and you have the viol more violent south, the relatively more stable north. Uh, uh, but in it, whereas um, in Iraq, you have a, both a high degree of local self-government and a, a, a system that entrenches power sharing at the center, in Afghanistan, you have a Napoleonic constitutional structure, highly centralized, uh, in the sense that uh, the central government appoints the governors, uh, the, all the ministers, the education department at the local level 
is, is controlled from Kabul. There's not a local authority. Uh, the, the, the provincial councils are effectively just advisory bodies. Um, and there's also a winner-take-all system at the center. So uh, you have an election for president, somebody wins, and that person then uh, exercises basically all power. There's a, a really a, quite a weak parliament. The president controls the Supreme Court. The president controls, and this turned out to be critically important, the Independent Election Commission. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 and, uh, and, and the other structures of government. Uh, now, at least that's how it works in, in theory. In reality, of course, since it's a very diverse country, both ethnically and geographically, what this really means is that the president doesn't control uh, parts of the large parts of the country. The Tajik areas are on the ground significantly self-governing. That's true of the Hazara regions. And when you get to the Pashtun regions, and one of the points to make here is that we talk about the Taliban, it is almost exclusively a Pashtun movement. So it, 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 is a, it, it, it operates only among the 45% of the country that are Pashtuns. Uh, and thus the north is, and the central highlands, certainly the central highlands, and to a lesser extent the north are relatively stable. Uh, the, um, it, it, one of the things, uh, and this was proposed by um, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who was the Karzai's principal challenger. Uh, interestingly, um, a man who was, the, was one of the few true Afghans, in the sense that his father was a Pashtun and his mother was a Tajik, but in spite of that, he was actually thought of by everybody as a Tajik, uh, and, he, and he, he didn't. There wasn't. He didn't have. There was no shared identification among the Pashtuns with him. Uh, but what what he proposed, and what I I think uh, makes sense, uh, is uh, that uh, there be entrenched power sharing by uh, devolving power, by taking significant powers away from the president. Uh, having a cabinet, a prime minister and cabinet chosen by the parliament with, with the same kind of bargaining that takes place in Iraq. In truth, what Afghanistan needs is an Iraqi-style constitution, also with elected uh, local government. Now, um, uh, I want to emphasize in the case of both Iraq and the United States, uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, it's really not for the United States to uh, impose any solution. Uh, and so, yes, there's given the significant investment, particularly that we have in Afghanistan, um, we're transitioning out of Iraq. Um, <clears throat> our, ours was a unwelcome uh, uh, invasion of Iraq, except by the Kurds. Uh, it's really, a, a, and the dynamic is very different. The way we're viewed is different. Um, so our, our ability to shape events, political events in Iraq is much less, and, and I would very much urge a a lower profile there. But in, in the case of uh, Afghanistan, we're ramping up. Uh, it's very much welcomed. It's essential for the Karzai government to its survival. Uh, and it's not unreasonable to say, well, we have 100,000 troops there. There are additional 30,000 from NATO. We're spending all this money that we expect something. Uh, and we certainly, and, and what is it that we ought to expect? Well, we ought to expect a credible partner. Uh, and the problem is that credible partner does not exist. Uh, the Karzai administration has for the last eight years been characterized by ineffectiveness and toleration for corruption, toleration of corruption. Now it's in office by virtue of massive fraud and it is seen as illegitimate and rightly seen as illegitimate by a large segment of the Afghan population because it actually didn't, Karzai didn't win those elections. Uh, uh, and uh, it isn't, incidentally, that the Electoral Complaints Commission took Karzai slightly below 50 percent and Abdullah <laughs> gave up because he recognized it was hopeless. Uh, the, in the, the Electoral Complaints Commission uh, uh, did a statistical <coughs> sample 
because all it needed to do was to bring him below 50 percent. There could be a runoff. It didn't need to determine how many votes he actually got. But based on what, what I know from the staff is that Karzai's vote was probably around 41 percent, not 49 percent. And Abdullah's was not that much far behind, maybe 35 percent. Uh, so this was a much closer contest. Uh, I think Abdullah was right not to go to the second round because the Independent Election Commission uh, was moving to uh, increase the number of polling centers when the root of the problem was ghost polling centers, that is, polling centers that never opened, never existed, producing a million phony ballots. Uh, and um, because it rehired, in every case, the fraud was either perpetrated by the Election Commission staff or they collaborated with those who who did the fraud, or they knew of the fraud and didn't report it. And, and every one of those um, people who were, were responsible for the staff were being rehired. In fact, a little aside, exactly one person has lost his job over fraud in the Afghanistan elections. And that wasn't one of the people who committed the fraud. <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in any event, well, it, the, the result of this process is that we don't have a credible partner. Uh, and that, and, and that, uh, that's the missing link in, the, in, in President Obama's strategy. Uh, and it's what makes it so difficult to implement. Uh, you ha the idea of protecting the troops, okay, of protecting the population, okay, you can do that. You can clear the Taliban out of an area, that's hard. Uh, you can, but then you need something to happen, otherwise you're gonna be there forever, specifically. Uh, what you need is uh, for, the, for there to be an Afghan army to come in and help you secure it and eventually to take over. Uh, you need an Afghan police to provide order. And then you need an Afghan government or some kind of government that can provide public services, honest administration, and can win the trust of the people. The Karzai government can't do that, won't do it. Uh, and the way in which most Afghans experience government. Well, it, there's a lot of talk in Washington about corruption, but, and that's there, of course, but that isn't the main point. The, the, way, the main way they experience is, is as abuse of power, and people operating with impunity. And it isn't, it isn't just government officials. Uh, it's really the local power brokers. Uh, and again, one of the applying our cultural standards, we, we imagine that if you're out of office, you're out of power. So if we think there's a, a corrupt governor or an abusive governor, we want to get him out of office. And that, but it doesn't change things because the guy still actually uh, runs things. Uh, and, once it, and the dilemma, the difficulty we face here is that once you have, um, uh, uh, well, the, 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 I mean, there, there's a, excuse me, uh, the, the, the dilemma is that uh, once you've gotten, I mean, even if you've removed these guys, they're, they're, they're still in power. And once the, the, the po population has lost confidence in the government, even if you could miraculously get honest administration, it doesn't mean that you're going to regain the confidence of the people. That's the problem. Uh, because in, or, in order for somebody to sign up on the government side, they basically put their lives at risk. The, the Taliban uh, is basically leaves the elders alone unless they're aligned with the government. So uh, you, you, you would need a large critical mass to simultaneously go over to the government side, and that's very hard. Uh, so I don't see that this piece is going to be readily fixed. Uh, I do think meaningful elected local self-government will help, but it's by no means a, a panacea. Let me just say a, a, a word about the police and then uh, uh, just a, a word to respond to what uh, Avan said about um, Pakistan. Um, on the issue of the police, uh, there's a real dilemma here, which is that, uh, that we have an eight-week training course for police, uh, which is relatively short, but if you want to get large numbers, you can't train them for long periods of time. Trouble is you have people who come in who the first few weeks are spent on basic uh, things like basic hygiene. What is required when a whole bunch of men live together? Uh, and then most of them are illiterate. 
And so if you really wanted to get a, a higher quality police, you'd have to have a multi-year training course that included such things as teaching them how to read and write. And if you, but if you did that, at the end of the process, you would have a relatively educated person who wouldn't want to be a policeman. So, uh, and, 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 and these are, are some of the, of the dilemmas we face. And, and some of these dilemmas, I, I won't go into it, come from imposing our idea of what the Afghan army should be, what our idea of the Afghan police should be. Ambassador uh, Mort Abramowitz has raised this, and I won't go, go further, but he does observe that Afghans have, have, have been, they are not unknown for their fighting prowess, and how is it that we need to spend so much time training them how to fight? Um, let me turn to the question of Pakistan. Uh, the the ex extraordinary thing about, pa about the U.S. relationship with Pakistan is that the Pakistanis remember everything and the Americans remember nothing. And as a result, we simply adopt the Pakistani narrative of what happened. And that a narrative is of the U.S. as an unfaithful ally, that we lost interest. Well, th that isn't how it happened. Uh, uh, first, uh, the U.S. having, um, well, Having embraced Pakistan in the early, uh, 1981 uh, after the Soviet invasion, uh, Pakistan then made a commitment to the United States. That General Zia came and he said, Pakistan has neither the means nor the intention of developing a nuclear explosive device. Congress put this into law, and I had a lot to do with that, actually. Uh, that was simply putting his promise, his commitment, which nobody made him offer, into law. They knew that if they crossed the line on the nuclear program that their uh, 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 weapons and aid would be cut off. And they did, and it was cut off. Uh, and we now are in deep apology mode for their breaking their commitment. And that reflects, I think, the larger problem of the relationship, which is that it, it, we have always viewed it as we, as Pakistan is doing something for us, and we have to, and, and therefore, um, uh, uh, and therefore, you know, we are not sufficiently grateful. And that more or less is the Pakistani narrative. But the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was a lot bigger threat to Pakistan than it was to the United States. And we might have approached it by saying to Pakistan, to General Zia, well, if you want our help, here's our conditions, and we expect you to keep them. Instead, we approached them from a position of weakness, and we said, if you will sign up with us in fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll provide all these goodies. And Zia said, yes, and I want to control it. And of course, the most significant thing he wanted to control was to decide who, in, who among the Afghans got the U.S. assistance. And he gave them to the very people that hate us the most, that are, that are our enemies. Uh, and incidentally, no Soviet ever attacked us from Afghanistan. But of course, the very people that we funded, and we funded because Pakistani, as Zia insisted we fund them, were the people who uh, ultimately were responsible for uh, the, uh, or contributed significantly to the attacks on the United States. And the same, frankly, blank check approach was applied toward Musharraf uh, in the Bush administration. Uh, there is, however, no easy solution to the problem in Pakistan because Pakistan is a divided country. It's certainly divided ethnically uh, with a significant independence movement in Balochistan, late separatism in Sindh, uh, and the fact that the Pashtuns are on both sides of the border. But it's also divided horizontally in the sense that there's a civilian government uh, but there's also the army, which has run things formally for half of Pakistan's history and informally for the other half, for most of the other half. There's the ISI, which operates within the army. And then there's the supposedly rogue elements of the ISI. So if we were to lay down uh, some of these conditions, threaten to cut off aid to Pakistan, who would we, who would we be uh, hurting? Uh, uh, and would, uh, would we be serving our interest? I would argue that, in fact, our interest lies in strengthening Pakistan's civilian government. Uh, I know there are many criticisms of the president, uh, and uh, he's a less than perfect human being, 
But the fact is it would be awfully good if Pakistan had one civilian government that actually served its term and then left office rather than being overthrown. Uh, and the civilian government has a different approach to India than the military. Uh, the Pakistani military, I mean, you spoke of it as a, um, uh, India as the enemy. Uh, well, it, it's interesting. If you talk in Pakistan to the military, actually, if you talk to them almost any subject, uh, you know, flower arrangements, uh, and within a few minutes, the, su the subject of India will come up. You could spend all day in India talking about security issues, and the subject of Pakistan does not come up. India has moved on. Uh, Pakistan's military has not. And of course, their well-being depends on the Indian threat. Uh, that's the, the raison d'etre. Uh, uh, and it is why they do incredibly reckless things, like support terrorists who are responsible uh, for uh, a number of attacks in India, including the Mumbai attacks, which are the one thing that could lead to a, a Pakistan-India war, uh, and why they believe it's useful to be fighting India in Afghanistan, both against the Pashtuns, against the Tajiks, and the Taliban against the uh, Karzai uh, government. Um, so uh, as, as, as tempting as it would be to think of Pakistan as a unity, unitary actor subject to pressure, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, and so I think we have to operate with the reality of Pakistan, and that reality is that we, would, it, we will be much better off if democracy really takes root in the country, if it becomes institutionalized, if, it can gain, if the civilian can government can gain a measure of control over the military, and that's not impossible. Uh, some of the shift that's taken place this year in terms of the military fighting the Pakistani Taliban, uh, which they were reluctant to do, is, is under pressure and direction from the uh, civilians. Uh, Pakistan was much less engaged in Afghanistan during this election period than it had been in 2004. And that was the civilian government's policy decision that they didn't want to be involved. Uh, again, it's far from, far from perfect, um, but it, it's not impossible. Um, and I think over time, what we want to see is strengthen civilian government in Pakistan and for it then to pursue some of the ideas that President Zadari has but are shared by other Pakistani politicians of cooperation with India Pakistan, and, and Afghanistan, a regional market, even Pakistan providing infrastructure for India. Let me stop there and uh,